John 11. I'm going to just kind of go through it slowly and, and bring some points out of it. So John 11, 1 through 4 to start. Now a certain man was ill, Lazarus of Bethany, the village of Mary and her sister Martha. It was Mary who anointed the Lord with ointment and wiped his feet with her hair, whose brother Lazarus was ill. So the sisters went to him, to Jesus, saying, Lord, he who you love is ill. But when Jesus heard it, he said, This illness does not lead to death. It is for the glory of God, so that the Son of God might be glorified through it. Now, Jesus knew Mary, Martha, and Lazarus. And here it says, The one you love. Jesus loved Lazarus like a friend. They were friends. He knew him. And Lazarus was obviously very sick because you wouldn't go interrupt Jesus for a tummy ache, right? Like Jesus, Lazarus has a tummy ache. He didn't just have a headache. Lazarus was obviously very sick. They probably tried everything they knew. They probably, pro that got backed up. Hold on. They probably tried. That, that's how it works. They probably tried every herb, every remedy, every doctor they could, but Lazarus wasn't getting any better. And so they sent to Jesus. And they said, the one you love, your friend, is sick. Jesus said, don't worry about it. This sickness isn't unto death. Don't worry. He's not. This sickness isn't going to cause him to die. It's going to be for the glory of God. See, now I want to tell you, when God says something, it happens, right? God can't lie. When, when, God, when something comes from the mouth of God, it's a promise. It's a covenant. It's a decree. It's going to happen. God can't go back on his word, and he can't change his word. What he says happens. So I'm sure the disciples, as they probably knew Lazarus as well, just thought, great. At first, the news probably shook him up, but then they thought, don't worry about it. Like in Australia, they say, no worries, mate. No worries. Everybody say, no worries. No worries. They probably chilled out. Awesome. This sickness isn't going to be under death. We don't have anything to worry about because Jesus said, it wasn't going to happen. So now let's go to verse 5. Now Jesus loved Martha and her sister and Lazarus. Say he loved them. So he dropped what he was doing and he ran to go to Lazarus. I'm sorry, that's, that's not what it says. But to be honest with you, that makes more sense, doesn't it? Jesus loved him. His friend was sick. So as soon as he heard, he dropped what he was doing and he ran to go to Lazarus' side. But wait, that's not what it says. It says Jesus loved them, so when he heard that Lazarus was ill, he stayed two days longer. Is that confusing? It's confusing to me. When I read it, it was like he loved them, so he didn't go to his side. Hmm. That's not what I think I would have done, but I want to tell you, God's ways are higher than our ways, isn't it? The way God sees things are different from the way we see things. The way God does things are different from the way we do things. We'd probably choose a different path, but God knows the better path. And I just want you to keep that in mind that his ways are so much higher than our ways. So, verse 6. No. Yeah, okay. We just read that. But we'll read it again. So when he heard that Lazarus was ill, he stayed two days longer in the place where he was. Then after this, he said to his disciples, let's go to Judea again. So he stays two days after his, Lazarus is sick. Then he finally says, all right, let's go. So now, let's jump down. We're going to go to verse 11. So he says, after saying these things, he said to them, our friend Lazarus has fallen asleep, but I go to awaken him. The disciples said, Lord, if he's fallen asleep, He'll recover, right? And I want to point something out here that we always see things and judge things and judge the outcome of things by natural sight. We, we see something in the natural. We, we hear things. We sense things in the natural, and we think that's the way it is. Jesus said it's not going to be unto death. Then Jesus said Lazarus is sleeping, and they probably thought, fantastic. You said he wasn't going to die. Now he's sleeping. He's going to recover. What are we going back there for? It's all fine. But see, you have to understand, we see things only with the natural senses. We see what we see in front of us. We hear things. We see it. But 
But Jesus has a different perspective. See, he doesn't only see what's right in front of him. He sees what's going on in the spiritual realm. He sees all eternity past. He sees all eternity future. He sees how something's going to affect not only you, but your kids and your grandkids and their grandkids and their grandkids after that in a whole city and a whole town and a whole village. So Jesus has a perspective on things that's a little different, but as you'll always see we do and as you always see they do, they just judge things by the natural sight of what they think is going on around them. So Jesus says, let's go. He's sleeping, and I'm going to go waken him. And they're just thinking natural. That's great. If he's sleeping, he's going to get better. But he says, focus, disciples. That's not what I'm talking about. Then he says this. Then he told them plainly. Like, I don't know, I'm just reading into this, but to me it's kind of like, he's sleeping now. And they're like, well, that's great. He's sleeping. Like, listen, come on, focus. I'm going to tell you something. He's dead. All right? He says, he's dead. He says, our friend Lazarus has fallen asleep, but I go to wake him. The disciples said, Lord, if he's fallen asleep, he'll recover. Now Jesus spoken of his death, but they thought that he meant he was taking a rest and sleep. Then he told them plainly, Lazarus has died. Let's just stop there. Hold on. The bomb just dropped. Wait, wait, Jesus, didn't you say this sickness wasn't going to end in death? H have you ever had that where you had a promise from God? Maybe you, you had a verse that just stuck in your heart about provision, and, and maybe you have a verse about healing, and maybe God's given you a vision or a dream and all these promises over your life. But then you get the phone call, then you get the news, then you get the message, then you get the doctor's report, and the very thing that you thought God said to you is now the very opposite. See, because God said, Jesus, or Jesus said, Lazarus, he's not going to die. But then all of a sudden he says, guys, i got to tell you, Lazarus is dead. Have you ever had the news dropped on you? Have you ever had that moment of what makes the moment so hard? isn't just the news. It's that what you thought God said and what you thought God promised is now the complete opposite of what's actually happening. And I can just sense the disciples going through that. They're going, what in the world? I I'm so confused. He said it's not going to happen, and now he just said it happened. So what do you do when your snapshot of the promise is now the opposite so he says, Lazarus has died. Verse 15, and for your sake, I'm glad I wasn't there. What? Have you ever felt like God wasn't there? Have you ever felt the bomb drop of a bad situation of some bad news and then you couldn't feel the presence of God at all and you couldn't sense his direction at all and you couldn't figure out what's going on into your natural eye? You felt like God wasn't even there? Have you ever been there? Because they're there right now. He says, I'm glad for your sake that I wasn't there. Why? So that you may believe. So that you might believe. But let us go to him. So check this out. This, I love this. So Thomas called the twins, said to his disciples, let us go also that we may die with him. What a drama queen. Oh, my goodness. Come on, man. It's like Lazarus is dead, but we got to go wake him. Then let's all go die. Oh, man. You just got to love some of the people that God can use makes us think he could use us. Amen? So then in verse 17, right after Mr. Drama Queen there, we have verse 17. He says, now when Jesus, and I don't know if we're, are we good here? Okay. Now when Jesus came, he found that Lazarus had already been dead for four days. Now I want to tell you something. Four days is significant because Jewish rabbis in their day believed that after three days, the soul was completely gone from the body. After three days, the soul, I mean, the, the soul was gone and the body was already starting to rot and already starting to stench. So when they get there, first of all, Jesus said he's not going to die. But by the time Jesus and the disciples get there, not only is he dead, he's dead, dead. Somebody say dead, dead. dead, dead. There's no more chance of recovery. His soul is gone. His, his, the chances of resuscitation, they're done for. The chances of getting revived, they're done. You can take him to every doctor you want to. They cannot raise this man from the dead because he's dead, dead. He's been gone four days. 
He's wrapped in the grave clothes. It's over. It's done. There are people gathering there and they're mourning. It's over. The very thing God promised was going to happen didn't happen, and it's over. There's no more chance. There's, there's no chance humanly possible. He's been dead four days, and he's in the grave, and he's stenching, and he's stinking, and he's rotting, and it's over. But there's another couple in Scripture that has to go through something similar. Abraham and Sarah. God promised Abraham, even though his wife Sarah was barren and couldn't have any kids, he promised Abraham, you are going to be the father of many nations. He says that kings are going to come from your lineage. He said to Abraham multiple times, look at the stars. See all those stars? That's how numerous your descendants will be. Hey, hey, Abraham, look at the sand of the sea. Can you count it? Because that's how numerous your descendants will be. That's an exciting snapshot, isn't it? Just imagine that family portrait. What a nightmare trying to get all those kids to smile. I can't get four of them to smile. By the way, just a, we have three kids, though. So I have another one she doesn't know about. No, not really. Everybody's like, that guy's weird. I'm leaving this church. I have three kids, sometimes four. Alea feels like she has four kids. Have you ever, this is a side note for fun, but have you ever tried to watch someone getting a kid to smile in a camera? So Alea's like, yay, smile. It's okay to laugh. Everybody just smile at me. Everybody, <laughs> smile. Say, we're a fun church. We're a laughing church. Everyone say, I like to laugh. Like to laugh. It's good, because you can laugh at me. I'm a big man. I can handle it. So check it out. Abraham has a dream. He has a vision. Can you imagine how they felt that day? Can you imagine how they felt when God gave them this vision and dream? They thought, man, this is awesome. But years go by, and years go by, and years go by, and nothing happens. And let's read one portion in Genesis 18. Verse 10 and 11. God comes down and he's talking to them and he says, The Lord said, this is after many, almost 10 years of waiting. I will surely return to you about this time next year. And Sarah, your wife, will have a son. And Sarah was listening at the door tent behind him. Now Abraham and Sarah were old. Say old. old. Advent. Pardon me. Yeah, they can laugh at that one. That was awkward. Now Abraham was old, advanced in years. The way of the woman had ceased to be with Sarah. Now I'm going to give you a, a, a deep theological lesson. You can take this back to, to theology class. You can, you can take, this is going to be deep, all right? The way of the woman had ceased. That biological clock, it stopped ticking. It's not ticking anymore, right? And that clock, not only does it stop ticking, it's done falling off the wall and it broke. There's no kids coming. All right, you can go to every doctor and every specialist. This 100-year-old woman ain't having baby. It's over. Sorry, Sarah. I know you had a promise, but that way that works in you, it's not working anymore. Right? That's my best male way to describe that. I don't know. It's just not working. I don't care how you slice it. I don't care what people say. Sarah, you had a dream. It's over. Not happening. Have you ever been there, though? I mean, you have this vision, you have this dream, you have this promise. And if you honestly told somebody, they'd be like, let's get honest, honey. You can't have kids anymore. You're too old. But wait, God promised. But what if? What happens, though, when, 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 when God promised you something? But the very place where you are, it seems absolutely impossible. When, when, when God promised you a healing and you're getting sicker, when God promised you financial provision and you're, you're looking at a bank account that's under, underwater, underdrafted, overdraft, <laughs> undering the overs, you're broke. You ain't got nothing. You're eating ramen noodles. And when, when, when God promises you joy and you're depressed, and when God promises you a child and you're barren, what do you do? What did they do? 
I love what happens here, and, and I want you to know that this has to happen. There has to be this process between what God promised, between what God said, between what he gave you the vision for and when you actually accomplish it, and you have to go through this for a reason because there's a key ingredient that you need, and if you don't have it, it's never going to happen, but if you go through this process, you can get it. And so let's go to Romans 5 to see what that is. You guys still awake? I hope so. That would be boring to preach to sleeping people. Romans 5, 3 through 4. Romans 5, verse 3 through 4. Not only that, but we rejoice. Say rejoice in our suffering. Say suffering. You weren't so excited as that one. Just rejoice. Rejoice in our sufferings knowing that suffering produces endurance. And endurance produces character. And character produces hope. Wait a minute. So, so God promises something, but then you have to go through some stuff. You have to go through something we don't like to talk about. It's called suffering. Why? Because suffering produces endurance and nothing great comes in a short time. Great things come with longevity. Great things come and nothing is built or grown without resistance. Have you ever tried to build your biceps by lifting air? <laughs> nothing happens. I've tried it. In order to build something strong, you have to have resistance. And nothing great comes from ease. Nothing great comes like a walk in the park. Nothing great comes quickly and easily. Because suffering produces endurance. And endurance makes you be able to last the long haul. And do you know what endurance produces? Character. And character has to be built before God gives you the dream or the promise or the snapshot because character is what's going to sustain you once you get there because if God gave it to you before you had the character, you'd fall apart. You couldn't handle it. You have to go through suffering because you have to build endurance because you have to get some character. And after you've gotten all that, you get something called hope. You get something called hope. That might be confusing to you, but, but hope is a key ingredient here. And I'm not talking hope like the world says hope. I'm not saying hope like a wishful thinking. I hope it happens. That sure be nice kind of hope. Like I hope this person sitting next to me will turn around and propose to me. That might not happen. That might be a whimsical hope. But I want to tell you, biblical hope is based on solid certainty. And biblical hope I've read this week, scholars say biblical hope is founded on the promises of God. Biblical hope, biblical hope is founded on the promise of God. What is the promise? When God says something, it's a promise. And when God says something from the time he says something until the time you get that thing, you have to go through a process called I'm going through some suffering, and that suffering produces endurance, and the endurance produces character. And when I'm done building that character, I get some hope, and hope is based on the solid certainty that God will do what he said he'll do, and he's more than able no matter what the circumstance. Can I get an amen on that one? It's sure quiet in this Catholic church today. Check this out. You heard me. Don't laugh, all right? It's all right. All right. Let's go to Romans. Do we have it up there? Romans 4, 18 through 21. So, suffering produces endurance. Endurance, character, character produces hope. Now, in Romans, talking about Abraham, it says, In hope he believed against hope that he should become the father of many nations. As he had been told, so shall your offspring be. He did not weaken in faith when he considered his own body, which was as good as dead, since he was about 100 years old, or when he considered the barrenness of Sarah's womb. And I want to tell you something. I want to tell you, this is uh, awesome, but I want to tell you, this isn't how he felt the whole time. Abraham had some mistakes. He had some times when his wife told him to go sleep with a maid, and he did it. Just a side note, husbands, don't do that. 
That's not a good call, right? But he messed up. Obviously, in that situation, he wasn't full of faith. Obviously, when he lied to the, the kingdom, when he went in and said that Sarah was his, his sister and not his wife, he wasn't full of faith the whole time. But it's in this ups and downs process that he developed the endurance. He developed the character. He developed the hope. And then the writer of Romans, Paul, can say this in hope. You know what the Bible says in Hebrews? That this hope is an anchor for my soul. This hope is an anchor for my soul. And you know what an anchor does? I hope so, because if not, we have issues. But an anchor, you throw it, and, and it goes in the water, and it goes and it attaches to something on the bottom of the shore so that when, when the wind and the waves are beating on the ship, it doesn't go off course. And I want to tell you, the Bible says in Hebrews, this hope, what hope? The hope that was developed through suffering, developed your endurance, to develop your character, produced hope that's an anchor for your soul, that's anchoring in the promise of God Amen. over your life. So just like Paul, you can say, in hope, he believed against hope. What? In hope, he believed against hope? In hope, he believed against hope when all odds seemed against him, when Lazarus was in the tomb, when, the, when, when his wife was 100 years old and the biological clock had stopped ticking, when you stood up and you had a promise from God, but you take account of the situation. And what you thought was the promise of God is now dead. And when you look, and, and what was once a thought for a miracle is now impossible. And when you look, that, that there's a broken ash heap of broken dreams and broken promises. What do you do? You grow up and you say, I will hope. And you throw out your anchor of hope on the promise of God that God is able to do all that he said he's going to do. God is able. And you throw out your anchor on the promise of God. And no matter what comes your way, you hold on to that anchor. No matter, come hell or high water, you hold on to the anchor. Come wind and waves, come depression and sickness, come, come death, come, come whatever may come, come whatever may come, I will not let go of the promise of God over my life because this hope is like an anchor for my soul that I will not let go. Now let's go back to John. I love this. Worship team, you can come back up. John 11. Verse 38. John 11, 38. Then Jesus. Well, let me, let me tell you this. You have to cast your anchor, and you have to hold on. Because you have to know that in the right time, in the right way, in the right season, God's going to do that thing that he promised you, even if everything against it seemed impossible. God will do it, and here's what happens. Verse 38, then Jesus deeply moved again, came to the tomb. It was a cave, and a stone lay against it. Jesus said, Take away the stone. Martha, the sister of the dead man, said to him, Lord, by this time there will be an odor. He's already been dead four days. Your, 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 your dream, it's dead. Your promise is dead. There's no children coming. In that grave lay a promise. In that grave lay a promise because Jesus said he wasn't going to die, but he died. And I believe that every one of you either have or you will have, it's guaranteed, a promise from God that's buried and dead and it's in the grave. Jesus goes up to the dead promise. He goes up to the grave. And Jesus said to her, did I not tell you that if you believed, you'd see the glory of God? If you believed, you'd see the glory of God. So they took away the stone. That was Jesus talking. You better wake up. You better wake up. So they took away the stone. Listen to this. And Jesus lifted up his eyes and said, Father, I thank you that you've heard me. 
I knew that you always hear me, but this I said on the account of the people standing around and that they may believe that you sent me. When he had said these things, he cried out in a loud voice, Lazarus, come out. You got to understand things that you tried to build for a life, a promise you tried to build for a decade, a promise you tried to see fulfilled for days and weeks and months and years that you could never accomplish on his own. Jesus comes along at the right time and he speaks life and he says, Lazarus, come out. And in one moment, in one moment, God can do what you couldn't do in a decade. In one moment, God can do what you can never do in a lifetime. In one moment, he could do what Abraham and Sarah could never do. He comes along in a moment at the right time and he says, come out. Promise, come out. I know you had a promise for healing and it seemed like it never happened. Come out. I know you had a promise for kids. You thought it'd never come. Come out. I know you had a promise for a healthy marriage and you feel like it'll never happen. Come out of the grave, promise. That's why you have to cast your anchor. You don't know when it's going to happen. You don't know when it's going to happen. And you don't want to let go of your faith. You don't want to let go of God just because you thought he said something and it's not happening. You have to cast your soul like an anchor to Christ, the one who's going to do the promise. The promiser will fulfill his promise. Don't let go of the promise. Don't let go of the promise. Don't let go. Because at that moment, at that moment, when you feel like all is lost and there's no way and your promise and your dreams are in the grave and they're rotting, Jesus will come and resurrect them. And and I love this. He says, he came out. The man who had died came out, his hands and feet bound with linen strips and his face wrapped in a cloth. You can stand with me a minute. You gotta get this though. You gotta, you gotta get this. This I, I wasn't even aware of. I didn't even have this revelation until about last night, and it hit me. And, and I believe it can set some people free in this place today. So listen up. After he rose Lazarus from the dead, he said the man who died came out. His hands and feet were bound with linen strips. His face was wrapped in cloth. See, see, he, he, he rose. He rose, but he was still covered in the remnants of death. He, he rose, but, but he still had grave clothes on. He, he rose, but he still had stench because I want to tell you, life isn't easy. And when you're going through suffering and when you're going to build endurance and you're going to build character, you're going to get some death residue on you. And you're gonna, your dream might rise up, but you still might be bound by depression. Your dream might come, but you're still bound by fear. Your dream might come, but you still have, have negative thoughts. You might have fear ruling your life. You might have something because the de- you might have been rose from the dead, but you still have the grave clothes on. But Jesus didn't leave him there. He didn't just raise him from the dead. And I believe many of you in here, you have grave clothes on still. You might have even been risen up to life in Christ. You might now be a Christian. You might have started following God finally. But you still have some grave clothes on. You still have doubts that plague you. You still have depression. You still have anxiety. You still have remnants from being dead that are still clinging to you but Jesus said this to him and I'm going to say it over you unbind him and let him go unbind him and let him go it's not enough for me that you are risen from the dead but I don't want you bound anymore I don't want you wrapped up in death clothes anymore I want you free I want you free And that's the promise of God for every one of your life, that he who the Son sets free is free indeed. He's not just wanting your life. He's wanting your life to be free. Free. So let's worship a minute, and then I'm going to give you a minute to respond and just focus on God, the one who sets people free, the one who resurrects dead dreams to life, the one who can resurrect any situation you're going through for the glory of God. We hope you enjoyed this message from Risen Life. To find more, go to risenlife.net.